friend And that's all I want to be I'm a lover of your presence I'm a lover of your presence I'm a lover of your presence And that's all I want to be I'm a lover of your presence I'm a lover of your presence I'm a lover of your presence and it's all I want to be I'm a lover of your presence I'm a lover of your presence I'm a lover of your presence And it's all I want to be Oh God, we invite you today And we want more of your presence Because your presence is beautiful It is wonderful God, you are so good you are so many things. You are more than my words can explain. We thank you for you. And that you loved us first when we didn't deserve it. We thank you, God, that you choose to lavish your love upon us. Thank you for your righteousness and your splendor and your majesty. Thank you for all that you are. We praise you for So wonderful. You are holy, 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 God most high and God most worthy. You are holy, 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 Jesus, you are. Jesus, you are holy, and you are holy, 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 God most high and God most worthy. You are holy, 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 Jesus, you are, Jesus, you are. Jesus, you are Jesus. Jesus. 
tear will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead no last will overcome your glorious face shining like the sun who is like you God just lift up our voices to just worship him my gender, but only my clothes. <laughs> so, here, if you want to make a picture with that gloves, do I have to change. <laughs> okay. Yes, this is a story how I met Jesus, or I call it clothing swap. How did God change my clothes? So, every story starts with once upon a time. It's coming. Once upon a time? Yes. There was born a little cute boy. It was me. I was the first of four. Oh, not yet born. <laughs> I was the first of four boys, and this is the second. You can see uh, I am from the time of the baby boom period, and I grew up in a Catholic family and being baptized as a child. You can all see my grandparents. One of them was my godfather and one godmother, and here um, I am 60 years of age. It was a celebration party of my first communion, and um, yeah, nice boy. No? <laughs> <laughs> so, my my parents were entrepreneurs, and uh, my dad was running a printing company, and my mom had a related shop in paper and office items and gifts. We lived in the center of the Middle Ages city of Mechelen. It was once the capital of the Netherlands, but it's long ago. <laughs> and uh, I had a carefree youth, 
and didn't lack any material goods. Oh. I have to wait a little bit because I like pictures. <laughs> they tell more than I can tell. So the second one. Which one are you? On the left, on the left, yeah. Um, I'm the oldest. As a young boy, I was learning music and piano at the Music Academy of Mechelen. <laughs> yes. And uh, I was singing also in a mixed, well-known Catholic choir that was committed to sing at a high mass on Sunday. And it was a great time. Yes, there you see. We had a yearly concert. And um, we had rehearsals on Wednesday and Saturdays. And before and after, we could play football, or basketball, or table tennis. And there was a bar. We could drink something. And we could play games and chat. And it was really a relaxed environment. Um, the choir conductor was a priest and a dean, and here you see him as uh, he was 60 years of his uh, anniversary as a priest. You have that keep in mind it, it, this person for later. Uh, in that time I was already sensitive for the gospel priest in the church and in the class. Uh, I heard the gospel also in the class, but I missed the point because it was too philosophical. And, well, during one day during the summer holidays, my mom asked me to go buy some paint in a specialist shop, and I took my race bike with 12 gears and must pass a very dangerous crossing. And then the unexpected happened. I was hit by a car at the side, was catapulted in the air, and fell with a bang on the ground. A little bit later, I heard the wailing sirens of the ambulance, and the last thing I remembered was that I was laid down in the bed of the ambulance. I lapsed into a coma for two or three days. And later, we heard that the driver didn't see me and stopped the car about 100 meters further because he heard something under his car. It was my bike. As a result of this accident, I had a real bad concussion. I was compelled to rest day and night in a dark room. I couldn't stand strong light of the sun, and any sound exploded my brains. I was 50 years of age at that time, and my mom, my mom took me to the neurologist and he put together some medicine to make me calm. I lived like a zombie all the week, of sleep. <coughs> Is this the life I wanted? I was searching for the meaning of life. In fact, I was looking for God. And as C.S. Lewis wrote, that we are made by God with an empty place that only He can fill. In that time, there were a lot of sects active on the streets like the Mormons and the Jehovah's and the children of God and the Jesus people and those but I had those books at home but they couldn't speak to my heart in fact fortunately so the neurologist gave me the advice that I must do some sport so I did some athletics and played table tennis with the brother of a piano student and so one evening um, when we get home at the door before leaving he told me out of the blue that I must dedicate my life to Jesus what did you say I must do what I laughed at him 
But he invited me to come to a presentation of a movie in the secondary school, and the name of the movie was Time to Run. It was a story about a boy that abandoned everyone who loved him, included his girlfriend, and he was on the run from his family, the authorities, and most of all, God himself. But he was confronted with a deep hole in his life that only could be filled with one thing. And that young pastor who was working among young people did an invitation to stay and explain the gospel by a well-known illustration. And in English, they call it the bridge illustration. But I was like Job. I heard from God in the class, even in the church. I admit I once lived by rumors of you, and now I have it all firsthand from my own eyes and ears. I'm sorry, forgive me. I'll never do that again, I promise. I'll never again live on crusts of hearsay or crumbs of rumors. So, I had to bow down my knees before Jesus and splutter my first words to God the Father, ask forgiveness for my sin, not believing in him as the Son of God, confess my sins and receive new life he gave in return the start of a brand new journey together with my new friend Jesus. And Jesus loved my outfit, but he wanted to change it for a new one, as Paul was writing to the Ephesians, that what you learned was to fling off the dirty clouds of the old way of living which were rotted through and through with lust illusions and with yourself mentally and spiritually remade to put on the clean, fresh clothes of a new life which was made by God's design for righteousness and holiness which is no illusion. I hope I could inspire you and show you the way to life for a life-changing encounter with Jesus. It's the beginning of a totally new life. God exchanged my old clothes for the new ones at the cross through Jesus. And it was Jesus' love who invited me. And he wanted to have a private conversation with us. But he will not force anyone. He's a gentleman who waits till we open the door. But the doorknob is on the inside, so we have to decide whether we let him in or not. The only thing I had to do was open the door. I was 50 years of age and had to make the most important decision of my life in the coming time. What will I do as an education? What to, what do I expire, ex expire as a profession? When will I meet my future wife? And in another time, I will tell you how God changed my life from then. This was the first episode, if you want, the encounter with Jesus. It's the most important. And I'm happy that my friend told me to dedicate my life to Jesus, although I didn't know what it was. So I have to learn everything from scratch, but that's for the next time.
thank you that you died on Abba. Thank you that because of you we are free. We are no longer held captive by sin. But we can live freely in your presence. Help us not to forget the gravity of that. Help us to always realize what a great thing you have done. love as you love us, God. So wonderful, so sacrificial, so unconditional. Thank you, God, for who you are, the example that you set. We give you all the praise. In your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. It's from Genesis 17, verses 15 through 21. God said to Abraham, As for your wife, Sarah, you will no longer call her Sarai. Her name will now be Sarah. I will bless her and even give you a son from her. I will bless her so that she will become nations and kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell on his face and laughed. He said to himself, can a 100-year-old man become a father? Or Sarah, a 90-year-old woman, have a child? To God, Abraham said, if only you would accept Ishmael. But God said, No, your wife Sarah will give birth to a son for you, and you will name him Isaac. I will set up my covenant with him, and with his descendants after him as an enduring covenant. As for Ishmael, I've heard your request. I will bless him and make him fertile and give him many, many descendants. He will be the ancestor of twelve tribal leaders, and I will make a great nation of him. But I will set up my covenant with Isaac, who will be born to Sarah at this time next year. Lord of the Lord. Let's go back to last week for a moment. To recap that, I had said that how we use our words in 2019 will have an effect on how our year goes. Um, and the focus of last week's sermon was to see that God blesses those who bless the blessed. Because blessing is an act of faith that pleases God. And to look at that shortly was just to consider Isaac and Jacob in Hebrews 11, where we're told that by faith they, they blessed. So I wanted to look at a second step, actually jumping off from those two characters and from Abraham as well, and look at blessing even when it's not easy, um, and blessing even when it's not clear cut, because there's a messy business about blessing. It's not as nice and wrapped up as sometimes it sounds like. So in Hebrews chapter 11, we're told that by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob blessed each of Joseph's sons. And so today I titled uh, Bless Them Both because there's, there's two people in both of those that are blessed. He blesses Jacob and Esau. Jacob blesses both of the sons. And even when we just had this reading of Abraham, that God said, Abraham, your wife Sarah is going to have a child. I will bless her, and that will be a blessed one. And Abraham asks God, won't you also bless my other son that I already have? Bless them both. A difficulty with Old Testament passages, uh, it can sometimes happen in the New Testament, but is that not we don't have these characters that are all good or all bad. It can get messy, and especially if we look at some of the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob families, there's some unhealthy family dynamics that happen. So even when we look at the blessing, we go, okay, what parts are we supposed to take? What are we not? In the story of Abraham, God had promised him, I'll give you a child through your wife. He didn't know what to make of that promise. He thought it was taking too long, so instead he takes another woman and gets her pregnant and has a child and thinks, hey, this is great. God says, no, I'm, I'm giving you a child through your wife, like I said, through Sarah. And so there's this wife through another woman as well as his own child and eventually uh, as a child through his wife. And so there's the family dynamic that's not good there and not appropriately done. Um, but God still says, I will bless in both of those children, though blessing differently. With Isaac, he has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Isaac very much prefers his older son, Esau. His wife prefers the younger son, Jacob. And at the moment when Isaac is going to bless his children, this is one of those like 
a, a Middle Eastern ritual. He's, he's going to give his blessing before he dies to his son. And, and he is intending to bless his oldest son, Esau. Even though, even at the birth, God had said, I, I will bless the, the younger and make his name greater than his older brother. But Isaac is intent to do that. So he says, Esau, go fix me this meal, do all this, and I'm going to give you my blessing. His wife overhears that, and then tells the younger son to deceive the dad, which he does, and the dad gives the blessing to the younger son, thinking he's giving it to the older son. And then the older son comes in, and the dad says, who is this? It's like, I'm, I'm your older son. And the dad realizes, I just blessed the child I wasn't expecting to be blessing. And Esau says, like, don't you have any blessing left for me, dad? Can you only bless one? Can't you bless us both? And the father does give him a, a different blessing. Then Jacob, this younger son who had deceived his dad, later, when he has had... Uh, 12 different sons through four different women that also has its very big issues and concerns of how he treated them, how he treated the sons, and showing favoritism and how that caused fights. But eventually, his one son, who the brothers pretended to kill, again, weird family dynamics, but, but they didn't kill him, they just said he was dead because they sold him into slavery, and like, that's better, and... He's eventually alive, and the dad doesn't know about it, but then when the dad does find out about it, he chooses to bless that son, Joseph, but not just to bless him, but to bless his two children that have been born, because the dad didn't even know that he had a son anymore, and then he finds out, I have a son and grandsons, and he blesses the grandsons. That's what it means when it says Jacob, he blesses Joseph's children, but all across that, right, we have some unhealthy dynamics. Um, that we'll maybe look at some of that a little more next week, but how we bless and choosing to bless, it was, it's weird to me when I read Hebrews and I see, and by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, when it doesn't sound like he did it by faith, it sounds like he did it by accident. <laughs> and, and yet when he gives this blessing to Esau, there is... Uh, I'm more clear of, okay, now I'm going to accept I'm doing this. That when Jacob blesses the two sons of Joseph, in that there's this conversation because he starts to actually bless the younger one with a greater blessing than the older. And Joseph says, oh, Dad, you're getting it wrong. Um, you're actually supposed to bless them this way. And Jacob says, no, I, I know what I'm doing. So with Isaac, he's blessing with, without apparently accidentally. With Jacob, he's blessing against the wishes of someone else. Mm -hmm. And it leaves me with questions of how, what does it look like to bless people by faith? Um, so here are some quick thoughts on that. Um, to bless them both does not mean you have to bless them the same, because as with Isaac, as with Jacob, as with Abraham, the, the sons are both blessed, but blessed differently. Um, faith that even when you blessed on accident, and even when others don't disagree, that God is faithful to bless. That there's, there's the faith of Abraham to even ask for a blessing in the midst of his mistake, and say, God, I admit that was a problem, but can you still bless others despite my mistakes? But that there can be blessings in your consequences. God can make good things come out of even the consequences of bad actions. But on the flip side, there can be consequences in the middle of your blessings. In Hebrews 11, we're told of those two men blessing the children. And then in Hebrews 12, we're told that God, like a father, disciplines his children. And those seem to be, maybe importantly, that they are connected, that God blesses and disciplines together. And that we should continue blessing even when it isn't easier, clear cut. To choose, even in strange, difficult circumstances, to see how is it that I can choose to bless. And as I was thinking about all of these things yesterday, and I had through the week, but. I was at home and like, okay, I'm sitting down and writing some things out. 
As I'm walking down the stairs, thinking about, bless them both, the doorbell rings. And I hadn't expected anyone to show up at my door, so I answer it, and it's this seemingly nice older lady with uh, a good cause for me to give money toward. And often my typical response to those is the, oh, no thank you, I actually already give towards some other projects that were involved. I, through the church and those sorts of things, I have like, oh, this is what I give toward. Bless you, but I don't, I'm not trying to give right now. Um, I also have that like, she's asking something in Dutch and I can speak Dutch, but it's just easier to awkwardly be like, uh, maybe not can't. Which is what I did. And she said, okay, and then like, walks off and I shut the door. And then as I turn, I think, wait a second. I'm supposed to be talking about blessing them both. And I'm thinking, I only have the blessing that I normally give and I don't have anything to bless this person with. So as I was getting ready to go outside and run anyway, I put on my shoes, I, I grab something to give, and I find her a few doors down at the neighbor and said, oh, actually, here, yeah, I do have something, and I chose bless. Um, again, just those things of, okay, how do we choose to bless and, and not get distracted by all the other things going on in our life that we don't take those moments to bless people like I had? As I said, often... Things can feel unclear to me in the Old Testament. And when that happens, here's one of the things I do. I look at Jesus and try to see through that lens. So here are some things Jesus said about blessing and how that then I think connects. Many people, if you've been around a church or heard some of those things, you've heard one of Jesus' famous teachings called the Beatitudes. When he starts to tell people, blessed are those who are poor, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the meek, blessed are the pure, blessed are those who are persecuted. He gives all this list of people who, he's not speaking that they will be blessed, or he's not saying, oh, may God bless you. It's, they're blessed. These people are blessed of God. And how that was so revolutionary to the people in his time that when they think someone is blessed, it's... Their name is great, they're rich, everyone speaks well of them, they're highly honored, they have all that they could want, that's being blessed. And so if I want to bless the blessed, I bless the people who look pretty, have money, have good relationships. And if I want to follow through on that idea that I am called to be someone who blesses those who are blessed, and I look at who Jesus says are blessed, then am I putting my attention and focus to blessing the already blessed poor and hungry and meek and mourning the persecuted. If I'm to bless the blessed, that's not just blessing the people who look blessed to me. It's part of this by faith thing, because we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. But, so part of that is blessing people on, on both ends of the spectrum, not just the people who look blessed to me, but those who may not. But more so, um, in that same chapter, he gets later in Matthew 5 to verse 44 and, and the verses around it, where he says, you've heard it said, hey, speak good and do good to those who are good to you and not to those who aren't good to you. Well, here's what I'm telling you to do. Love your enemy and bless those who persecute you or pray for those who persecute you, but that word that's used for pray is also that word for bless. Bless those who are your enemies. And that gets followed up and taught in Paul's writings, in Peter's writings as well. James has stuff that could give us that idea that we are, instead of repaying evil for evil, repaying evil back with blessing. That we are supposed to choose to bless both people, not just the good people, not just the kind people to us, but we are called to bless also those who are difficult. We are to bless those who are messy, because blessing can be a messy business. <clears throat> Jesus says, I mean, if you only bless those who bless you, or if you only speak well of those who speak well of you, how does that make us any different? How does that show us how does that show the world the character of a God who is holy? Which means he is set apart. 
So he says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Or other places say, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. The way that we choose to bless others, especially the way we choose to bless our enemies, will be one of those things that stands out no matter what generation or almost no matter what culture you're in, that that seems weird to people. Because it's so different from our, our natural feelings. Western, Eastern, honor, shame culture, innocence, guilt culture, power, fear culture, any, any sort of background, that seems strange to truly choose to bless those who have tried to curse you. Why can we, why can we be so open to bless people, even our enemies? I spoke a little bit about David last week, and here's something that King David wrote in a psalm. Let them curse me if they like but you will bless me. See, the reason why we can be free to bless others is because we're not depending our life upon their curses. We're depending our life upon God's blessings. And I'm not getting my validation from whether everyone else says they like me. I am looking to God for my identity, for my validity, and, and for Him to bless me, not me to adapt to everyone else so I can get their blessings. So he's not saying, let's get people to curse me. But he says, if they're going to curse, let them curse me. Because as I follow God, God will bless me. I will choose to live the life that gets blessed by him. A second reason why we can be open to bless even our enemies is because if we follow Jesus, that's what he did. And I'm reminded of that, especially on a day like today when we remember Jesus' sacrifice. Because we're told that even while we were God's enemies, Christ died for us to reconcile us to God. <laughs> and Jesus was doing that so that he could bless both. In the book of Ephesians, written by the Apostle Paul after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, Paul writes about this and says, We have been blessed in Jesus with every spiritual blessing. And, and as he starts to explain a bit more of, of who the we is, he starts talking about this people group that was every other people group than the Israelites. Because God said, Abraham, I will bless you for a purpose. I will bless you so I can bless all the nations of the world all the families of the earth. And when he does that, then we see that he's blessed the Jewish people, but Ephesians writes to us that, okay, and all the rest of you who felt like there was a time where you were separated from the promises and the covenants of God, you were without hope and without God, you were excluded. Well, Jesus, what he did was now in his body, you have been unified and he made peace between those that were Jews and those that were Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from those two groups. So us receiving the blessing of God was because Jesus found a way to bless Jews and Gentiles. He blessed both. Because that's his heart and his desire is to bless all. And so in Galatians, we're told that those who rely on faith are blessed just along with Abraham, who is the man of faith. Because God had announced that good news in advance to Abraham. All the nations will be blessed through you. So God is a blesser who wants to bless. And the... The beautiful thing is he's not afraid to get into the messy business of blessing. And Jesus showed that. Of knowing that he would be blessing peoples that not everyone else agreed with. Just like when Jacob is blessing the two sons and Joseph says, Hey, 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 Dad, you're doing it wrong. There were people who told Jesus, oh, You're doing it wrong. You're not supposed to be blessing these Sinners, or these prostitutes, or these tax collectors, or, or these other people groups right now. But Jesus gets into that messy business of blessing. 
even the messy business of blessing people who have made mistakes, who have harmed him, who eventually killed him. So why can we bless even when it's messy? I guess the shortest way I'd like to say it is this. We bless not because we have faith in a system, but because we have faith in a relationship. I can bless because I know who I am with God. I know who He is. Not because I know all the rules of how this will work every time. Not because I know how to follow the conventions of how my society says this is how you bless or who you bless or who it's okay to hang out with. Not because I have learned the correct blessing styles from the best preacher or the best counselor or the best of, of anything, not because my, my teachers or my principals or my parents always agree with the style of blessing. I can bless because of relationship with God and faith in Him and His ability to help me through the messy business of blessing. My hope is that this year you'll do the same. That you'll be inspired and in full of the Spirit of God to get into this messy business of blessing the people around us. Those that sit in this room, those that you come across to many other times. To bless even your enemies, to bless those that are poor or persecuted, those that don't really look blessed to you. I hope you make that choice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want, I want to bless the people who are in this room, knowing that you're the one who's already blessing first. You, you bless them with, with individual gifts. You bless us all with Jesus and what he's done, and yet I, I do believe that you bless individuals in different ways also. God, I pray that we would walk in that, that we would accept the discipline and those consequences that sometimes come in that process of blessing. And when it's not easy, when it's not clear, I pray that you would give us wisdom and integrity and love so that we can bless well. In Jesus' name we pray.